So today I'm going to talk to you about the early universe, so the very young universe, and how we can use observations of the sky on large scales to learn about the physics of the very small, so fundamental physics. So I'm a cosmologist, and the work of a cosmologist is to look at the sky and try to make some educated guesses about the structure of the universe, the history of the universe, and hopefully about the nature of all fundamental <laughs> physics that governs the matter in the universe. So that's quite an odd job actually, because unlike most sciences, where you can just repeat your experiments <laughs> over and over again as you wish, in cosmology we only have one universe, so we only have one experiment, this one sky, and that's all we have to work with. So yeah, looking at the sky, the first thing you may learn about the universe is that it is pretty homogeneous. So what do I mean with that? So in this picture here, actually I don't have a photo of the sky, so it's a bit sneaky. I have a snapshot of a simulation of <coughs> galaxy formation and evolution. So here, purple is gas, and as gas gets together, it gets more dense and hotter, and it gets more yellow in these plots and these yellow dots are actually representing galaxies. So this is a snapshot of a simulation, <laughs> but if you actually um, looked at the actual distribution of galaxies in the sky, you would realize that it also has this distribution, this foam-like, sponge-like distribution that fills up the space in a very homogeneous way. All right, so thanks. So if it is true that the universe is homogeneous, if we look at uh, light emitted by the universe when it was really old, uh, light very old when the universe was very young, we should be able to see this homogeneity. And in fact, we do. So this picture is a picture of the whole sky that has been uh, made into a plane, just like a map of the Earth is put into a plane. And what we can see here, except for that yellow line that is just the galaxy, and we don't care about the galaxy, <laughs> Uh, that green line, that is the most ancient light we can see in the universe, if you look at the sky. And uh, it was emitted when the universe was very, very, very young. It was 400,000 years old, which for universe standard is quite young. And it arrives to us in the microwave. And we can see that it is very homogeneous. Basically, it emits in the same temperature all over in the sky. And because of that, we call it the cosmic microwave background. Okay, so this idea that the universe is homogeneous is what we call the cosmological principle. But we know the universe is not that homogeneous. I mean, we see structure everywhere, galaxies, planets, stars, us, you know, this room is not homogeneous. So there must have been an origin for this structure that we see today. Because if the universe has been completely, fully homogeneous since the beginning, Nothing would clump together by the action of gravity to form structures, and today we would see a completely flat, homogeneous, and interesting universe. So there must be some origin of this structure, some seeds, primordial seeds that were really small in the beginning, in the beginning of the universe, but by the action of gravity just became bigger and bigger and bigger. And if the seeds were there, then we must see them in the cosmic microwave background. And indeed we do. So this picture here, it's just the same as when I showed you before, but the galaxy has been removed from this picture. And also the mean average temperature, so the mean average temperature represented that green, and what has been removed. So what we see here are fluctuations in temperature. Blue dots are patches that are slightly colder, and red dots are patches that are slightly hotter. So what we see here is these fluctuations in temperature in the cosmic microwave background that are actually fluctuations in the density of the universe when the universe was really young. And these fluctuations in, in the density are just seeds. Seeds that by the action of gravity, with the passing of time, got together, became bigger and bigger and bigger, and became galaxies and everything else that we see today. So there must be a mechanism that gave rise to these seeds of structure. There must be some origin for these structures. And uh, if this mechanism exists, it happened when the universe was very young, when the universe was very, very dense, very, very, very hot and very, very energetic. So this is a great opportunity for us because we don't really know what's the physics governing 
these type of environments that are very hot and very energetic and very dense. What we know is that quantum mechanics explains very well most phenomena that happen at the atomic or subatomic scale. We know that general relativity explains very well what happens or most of the things that happen at cosmic scales, so very large scales. But when quantum mechanics and general relativity get together, which is in these environments, like the very young universe, very, very, very energetic and very hot, then our physics completely break down and we have no idea what is going on. These, we've been trying to search for theories that can explain these type of uh, environments. You might have heard of string theory, for example. But it, we would like to test these theories, but it's actually very hard to test them because obviously to have an experiment to test them, we would have to have experiments with a lot of energy. So for example, in, the, in CERN, in the Large Hadron Collider, people are trying to test some of these energies and test some of these theories. But you see, here we have an amazing opportunity because if the mechanism that gave rise to these structures happened when the universe was really, really hot and energetic, then the distribution of these fluctuations we see today must have imprinted on it the fingerprints of these exotic physics. So we could use observations of the sky and these observations as a laboratory to test fundamental physics at energies that are much higher than any experiments that we can actually use here or build here on Earth. So this is an amazing uh, opportunity for us. Um, so this is where we are today. We have this amazing picture with enormous resolution of these fluctuations. This was uh, collected by a satellite called Planck, which is in orbit outside our atmosphere, and it's only looking at the cosmic microwave background. And actually, these data that we see here was collected by Planck and was released just earlier this year. And we have this staggering amount of information. It's not just this, we have also it's not just the temperature fluctuations, we also have other amounts of the, uh, information that also should contain the fingerprints of fundamental physics, like, for example, the polarization of light. So in this picture, we see red is also hotter patches and blue are colder patches, and it has the same resolution, but they just smoothed it out so that it's easier to interpret. And you can see this texture, that texture represents lines of the polarization of light that is just related to the direction the light propagates. And that should also contain information about this fundamental physics. So let me just zoom in because this is a really staggering image. It's quite incredible the amount of information that it is encoded in these observations. And it's just so much resolution and just so much data. And it's quite hard to imagine how exactly we are supposed to extract information and these fingerprints about fundamental physics. I mean, how are we going to extract what we want from this amount of information? The first thing you can see happening in this image is that it has a lot of symmetries and a lot of patterns. And these symmetries and patterns actually are quite similar to the symmetries and patterns we can see in this distribution of galaxies. Of course, but that's not really surprising in the sense because the fluctuations in temperature are the seeds for galaxy distribution. So it seems like these symmetries and these patterns are related to something fundamental of this, this matter distribution mm -hmm. and probably are related to something fundamental of the physics that gave rise to it. And it seems like if we are able to understand the symmetry, we are up to something. This is actually not something that surprising or that new because in the nature, we have symmetries everywhere. I mean, vegetables, my favorite vegetable, the Romanesque cauliflower, on galaxies, planets, stars, crystals, that's a snowflake. Everything that we see around us demonstrates an enormous amount of symmetry, like as if it was a fundamental characteristic of nature to be symmetric. And that's not a coincidence. Symmetry is an unavoidable consequence of the physics behind it. So if we understand the symmetries of what we see, we would be able to understand the physics of the, uh, the physics that create what we see. Actually, in the beginning of the 20th century, a very uh, incredible physicist called Amy Noether, she was very interested in this relationship between symmetries and physics. And she made it concrete, this uh, relation. Basically, what she taught us was that to understand a physical theory and a physical system that we don't understand very well, 
All you have to do is to concentrate on the symmetries. And if we understand the symmetries of that given physical system, we will know exactly what's going on, or at least we'll have some hints of what's going on. So going back to our problem, or in the early universe, what we have is this environment that we don't really understand, these high energies and high temperatures. And we have some theories, some candidate theories that might explain what is going on, like string theory. And they are very complicated and it's very hard to make predictions out of it. But we know, well at least Amy Nether taught us, that what we can do is that we can focus on the symmetries present in this theoretical physics. And if we focus in these theories, we might understand what is going on. And we know the symmetries must exist because we see it in the data. We see it in the cosmic microwave background. So basically, if we focus in the symmetries, we will have a way to communicate between the theory and the data. And that uh, focusing in the symmetries will be our way to <coughs> extract information about the very little looking at the very large. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you.